Thank well, you nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, why don't you just tell us who you are? Well, I'm Richard Ottaway. I was the Conservative Member of Parliament for Corrigan South until 2015. And in my last five years in Parliament, I was Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee with oversight of the Foreign Office. And for five years before that, I was a member of the Intelligence and Security Committee, um, which is oversight of the Intelligence Agency. So for 10 years, I've, I've got a pretty good handle on global security and foreign okay. policy issues. And I'm already thinking you were Governor Whip in the 90s. I was. I was Governor Whip in the um, time of mastery. Um, and under, under John Major. Uh, I've, uh, having been PPS to Michael Hasseltine for longer than I should have been. Um, and, <laughs> and, then, um, and then going into the Whip's office uh, was quite an interesting first parliament. Uh, you were there in mastery, trying to get mastery through. Yep. So how did you how did you do that? What are the tricks of trade? Well, mastery, well, at the end, I mean, first of all, John Major had a bigger majority. I mean, he had a majority, unlike Theresa May has today. And she, he, um, the rebellion was smaller. How many of these there? There were about a dozen. Oh, I mean, so, so, I mean we're, uh, and once she took them out, uh, it was dead level, zero, the majority was zero. And so every day we were having to work out how we get through the next 24 hours. But on a mastery at the end, um, John Major tied it to a confidence motion. Said, uh, you know, uh, which is before the fixed term parliament act, which we have now. So if, if they've been defeated, it meant a general election. So that sort of heavy handed tactic was the key in the end to ensuring victory. So there was a sort of part of loyalty there. I, rather than heavy handed, I'd say just firm leadership. Um, he, he was saying, back me or sack me. Okay. You know, and, um, and the party remained loyal. Okay. In the end, the rebels crumbled. So you just talk about a dozen. Uh, rebels and now you know, on either side probably got 48, 50 on the sort of right wing party, you have about 12, something 20 on the sort of left wing remaining yeah. side. How so what, what was the sort of main ground part? Where was the nexus of ideology towards Europe? In that sort uh, was of it, time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well. it was simply um, the, the the right hard Brexiteers now. Uh, this was their this was their birth almost. Their, okay. their birth. Yeah. Their, it was just a smaller group, which is over the last couple of decades has actually grown okay. um, and expanded. I mean, there were about a dozen then, and the European Research Group, the ERG, now is kind of, figures vary from fifty to eighty. So, so it's like an ink dot that's slowly grown and grown. Yes, and grown. Yes, although. More interestingly now, the hardline Brexiteers again have fragmented. That's often happens in politics, mm. the extremes. Mm. They are so principled that they are, they are constantly <laughs> fragmenting and, and reforming. And you've got uh, Brexiteers uh, uh, out at any cost. Yeah. And then you've got uh, Brexiteers out uh, on Canada trade deals. And then you've got Brexiteers out providing a bit more and so on and so forth. And so they have uh, fragmented. And which may yet be an opportunity for Theresa May to chisel away yeah. at some of the opposition. To so the, the Brexiteers of the 90s were, where were they? They were single, for a single market or were they, let's just leave Europe, Europe at all costs? They just saw Maastricht as the beginning of um, real European federalism. And they were right. Yeah. I mean, I personally didn't have any trouble with it. I, um, I, I just saw, uh, and as I believe today, that at the end of the day was a reaction to a hundred years of warfare yeah, inside of Europe absolutely. and this what we, and, uh, and it succeeded I mean look at your France <laughs> and Germany now wanting to form an army together. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and succeeded beyond our wildest dreams so um, and, and for that reason you know I, I, I remain very supportive but then it was it, uh, the Maastricht break was the beginning of the, of the federalism and the, the traditional Tory, yeah, far less militant than they are now. Yeah, they yeah. just said, "Look, as a matter of principle, old chap, I'm, I'm, I'm against that going okay. that far." You know, terribly sorry. So, as a whip, then it wouldn't. You know, you hear stories about whips making people cry and whips breaking down people. Was that was that was not was that your day or? Uh, yeah, uh, 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 <laughs> the whips. 
in, in order to persuade, I mean, for someone who gets into Parliament, they've got to be a pretty strong character anyway. Right, right. They've got to go for a selection process and beat lots of other people who want to be a candidate. Then they've got to win an election, and then they've got to make their mark inside of Parliament. So these are not wilting flowers. And to persuade someone to change their mind sometimes needs uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, persuasion. And you can argue the merits with them, but, but occasionally you just say, look, if you really want to be on that committee, I'm totally sorry, but you're going to have to vote for this. I mean, if, 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 if you don't, you won't. And again, sometimes it gets more personal. So, what do you, I mean, you talk about spread, there are spreadsheets now. Was there black, I mean, was blackmail in inverted commas? Um, no, I don't think blackmail. You, you, you just, everybody wants something. Okay. You know, and, and on lesser, a Maastricht, you can really, uh, very hard to make people change their mind, but on lesser issues, you can you could trade. Okay, so what about what you know, high fiscal situation? We have a government whip who doesn't believe in what he's whipping for. Do you ever find that that was the case for you? Um, well, you never agree a hundred percent with your party yeah. policy. Anyway, you, I mean, you go you go you go along with the ten percent you disagree with in exchange for everyone else back in the ninety percent that you want. I mean, big political parties are coalitions. Labour Party's coalition, Tory Party's circuit coalition of three groupings, in my view. And um, what are those three groupings? I mean, but, but the three groupings, I think, inside the Tory Party now are a sort of one nation, um, a centrist grouping. Then there is the traditional Knight of the Shires type Tory. Um, and then there is the hard, hardline uh, right winger now who perhaps could arguably feel comfortable inside Ukraine. Give me three sort of motif, three figureheads for each. I don't, I don't want to, to, to make it personal, but you've only got to pick up the papers to really start <laughs> identifying um, it. Okay, well, I mean, it's people like Ken Clark are uh, sort of one right. nation yep. centrist, and I'd say Jacob Reed Small is you know, the real, real hard, hard yep. line right winger, and then you know, take your choice in between those two. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in the ascendancy now? Uh, right down the centre, I think, is, is, is the centre group, which is where I used to sit. I mean, I was a One Nation Tory, but I always saw myself in the centre of the Tory party, um, never on the right wing. And they are by far the largest bloc. And I think they're really the largest. Prag- yes, I think they're pragmatism. Mm-hmm. They're, they're pragmatists. They just yeah. want to get the yeah, thing yeah. right. They say, right, we've had a referendum, we've got to go. What's the best deal we can crack? Mm-hmm. And I think that remains the largest bloc. Would you have praised Theresa May as being a member of that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, okay. And so, when when you're in partnership, yeah, you were there with Margaret Thatcher. You had the wets and the dries. Yeah. Would you count yourself as a wet? Are you in the middle? Are you dry? I was um, fairly dry economically, but fairly wet on the big different, different issues. I've okay. always favoured um, abortion rights, and, um, um, family planning, uh, and, you know. Uh, international family planning programs, um, assisted dying, um, right. these sort of issues I'm, I'm supporter of. Okay, okay, so were there times, that, do you think the Thatcher revolution went too far um, by the time she's gone, or did you, would you have been happy to describe it? Well, actually, if you look back at the Thatcher revolution now, I mean, it seems pretty modest compared to where <laughs> we are today, that is more or less uh, adopted by the Labour Party at the moment. I mean, except, you know, under Corbyn and McDonald, they are going to try and reverse the privatisation. So they're going to reduce yeah. nationalisation. But under Blair, they they just about adopted everything Margaret actually did. And what Margaret had was she had a plan. She knew what she wanted to achieve. She sort of identified the problems. Yeah. Took it forward. And I see shades of this in, in Theresa May. I I am full of admiration for the way she's conducting herself. Uh, she said, "I've got a plan." This is what it is. Back me or sack me. Okay. So you see Esther McVeigh just resigned. I don't know if someone else has just resigned, but you've got Esther McVeigh, Dominic Raab. She's always been a sister. A lot of people say she's toast. I don't see her as toast. I think she could survive those two resigning. I think if half the cabinet went, it, <laughs> yes. it, it, it might be difficult. I mean, they both they both go pretty hard line with the Brexiteers. And yeah. Dominic Raab's the person just been negotiating this wretched <laughs> agreement. So exactly uh, what is Angus uh, we're yet to hear. Um, so 
I, I, she can she can only be removed by a confidence motion inside the yeah. Party. yeah. And first of all, there haven't even been enough people to, to call for it to, to trigger it. And if they had, I'm pretty sure she survived by a substantial majority. So let's imagine she survives. Um, then what? Well, this is going to have to go to the floor of the house. The deal. I mean, there'll be a lot of be a lot of movement around uh, over the next two or three weeks. But it's beginning to look like. The boat will be just before the Christmas, yep. he says, sometime, yep. sometime in the middle of December. And what I... Uh, and it's only one's guess, which way it's going to go. Um, having been in the whip's office, I can see how the relentless pressure may turn. Uh, really cool. But it, it really, it's got to come down to whether it is the Labour Party back her. If they don't, then I think she, she will lose it. And then uh, Lord knows where we go after that. Labour will table a confidence motion yeah. to try and force a general election. The party will go rock solid um, together with the DUP, who uh, uh, will, will back us on that. And, uh, and that will be defeated. So there we are. She survived the confidence motion, but she hasn't got her deal. And then the, the big issue then is going to become referendum. Uh, do, do you think it will happen? Do we put the referendum, uh, do we put the deal yeah. to the people? Yeah. Do I think it will happen? Have the, have the chance to increase. No, I think, I think the likelihood is just the same. Uh, really? From the start? All, all the way from, uh, from the start. Uh, there's always been a sort of uh, undercurrent of support for it. And I thought Joe Johnson put it very well in his resignation the other day when he said, look, the people did vote in a referendum. But they had no idea that the deal now before us is what was going to be the outcome. And frankly, it's only sensible to put it to the people. And I, I couldn't agree with him more, more yeah, yeah. actually, because if we don't actually get the public to sign off on this, then uh, frankly, we're going to be sitting here 20, 30, 40 years still, time, still, still yeah, exactly. talking about, still arguing about it. Um, because the public will never have been consulted over it. Yeah, okay. So, and you, do you think uh, there is enough support for people's vote in Parliament? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of them, a lot of them, are sitting on the fence on it. I think, I think you've got to take a step at a time. Uh, vote on the on the deal. I mean, she, if she wins that, then yeah, yeah, yeah. that's all. Yeah. That's all. Um, if that's defeated, confidence motion, and that's defeated. Right. Let's sit back and take stock of where we are. Yeah. Okay. So let's imagine she wins the confidence motion. Um, then the Brexit, could the Brexiteers then say, well, now you have to do what we say. Could you, could you see a scene where we crash out with no deal? No. And of sure. that, I'm absolutely sure. Uh, I think that Keir Starmer, I'm no supporter of the Labour Party, but I think he's been actually quite clear about this, that uh, the Labour Party will make a serious move and table motions uh, uh, against crashing out without okay. a deal, uh, which I think will come out of the inside that. Okay, so your career charts then the Senate of Thatcher, the John Major years, and also what I want to get you on now is Tony Blair years. What was that like in this well, Tony Blair years, I mean, first of all, half the Tory party was blown out of war yeah. in the 1997 yeah. election. So, uh, it, it, before the election in 97, 340 of us went to uh, into battle uh, no, sitting MPs and only 160 came back. It was rather like coming back from the battlefield, frankly. Um, and so we, we were shell shocked. Um, we then turned to William Hague, who was perfectly decent. Uh, leader yeah. uh, of the opposition, but in my view, uh, peaked far too early. I think yeah, if he bided his time, he may well have become prime minister. Um, uh, and then, and then we went from William to Indem Smith to Michael Howard, and then to David Cameron. And we we were, you know, actually the morale inside the party. We know we are a small band of brothers. It was actually rather really? good. Okay. Um, except at the time when Ian Duncan Smith was absolutely on the only time a confidence motion procedure has been used. Um, and even then it wasn't actually very hostile. Um, Ian took it in admirable grace and uh, admirable style. Um, he's not someone who loses his rag over these sort of things. And he's, he's continued to play an important part of the party. But the Blair years, I mean, the reason Blair won 
but really he was a sort of centre right Tory. Right, right. You know, um, right. you know, they were no right. tax rises. Yeah. Uh, adopted or adopted our spending plans to for the first two years. Yeah. Um, adopted all the privatisations, and really, I think the, the difference, uh, the argument I had had, had still have with Tony Blair is on two things. One of his constitutional changes, I thought devolution of Scotland, uh, I don't know, uh, it could have been handled better, which is, uh, because, you know, he said this will end the yeah. demand for independence, yes. and it hasn't done that. Yeah. Um, and I devolution of Wales, I mean, the referendum is, so, so what, have you has, has that have you charted a, a difference in foreign policy? What sort of contours? What's the scene? Of the I, I think in, in foreign policy today, I think we're facing two big uh, big challenges. Um, one is the growth of the nationalist and the populist, um, yeah, yeah. Um, which we see around around the world, um, the sort of slightly auto autocratic um, leader um, and I think the second is the growth of that, uh, that or, or those autocrats I mean the, the nationalist the populist is against multilaterals yeah, um, yeah. like putting out the EU yeah. Farage yeah. Uh, Trump putting out uh, deals um, uh, that's the answer there, uh, is to argue for multilateralism, the way to, to achieve lasting change is through globalisation. Yeah. The second threat, which actually we're only just beginning to get our heads around and uh, we have to think about it a lot harder, is the growth of the autocrat. Yes. The, yes. Someone who, uh, who are offering competing values. China, which has no democracy. Um, no democracy. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Russia, which mockery of, <laughs> yeah, um, of, of a democracy, they are challenging our values. I mean, Putin, at the end of the day, wants nothing more than the dismantlement of the European <laughs> Union yeah. NATO. That's really uh, what he's up to, and, uh, and he'll do anything to achieve it. Um, but you see that Xi in China is making territorial gains, is ruthless in his commercial, in seeking to promote his commercial advantage. And of course, it has the huge backup of the world's largest single market. It's got yeah. 1, 1. 1.2 billion people all on the same system. Uh, so it, that's what had a lot of income that's going into the Chinese coffers, which allows them to be such a big player on the world stage. And that's set, that is the second challenge we have to get our head around. How does Britain respond? Well, I think um, if we do come out of the EU, I think we should still engage in as many multilateral organisations as possible. I still think it's a yeah. mistake. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, we have to engage on those um, uh, as much as we possibly yeah. can. And I think we have to show the autocrats that we rotate it. Okay. That we have to be prepared to defend our corner. Means we have to stick with, uh, okay, with uh, uh, try and support the EU to stay together and above all support NATO to stay together, which is why I think it's absolutely bizarre that France and Germany should now be calling for a separate European army. It's a sort of Macron esque type spat after his fallout with Trump, I think. Um, so, Europe, so England's foreign policy, Britain's foreign policy, UK foreign policy rests on two pillars. Which is number one, multilateralism. Yep. And number two, strengthening of NATO and the EU by extension of that policy. I couldn't put it better myself. Okay. Uh, so, what about America? Well, the United States is uh, going for a uh, sort of once every 50 year type uh, <laughs> spasm at the moment, you know, of, of Who's voting the election. Yeah, but the, the time of Truman, there were all these arguments for America first time arguments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 were very strong. Yeah, and um, though they've never been really manifest in the, uh, the way we have with Trump, I was listening to John Kerry speaking uh, earlier today. He he said if the Democrats argue a sensible case of how people's welfare can be improved, cut through the populist, yeah, exactly, uh, the yeah, populist exactly. language. Yeah, and I think. Uh, and I think if you have a democratic candidate who can see how people's lives can be affected by central government, 
and at the same time recognizes the United States' role on the world stage as the leader of the free world. Yes. Um, I think uh, I think Trump can be beat. Who do you think should be? Seen? I don't know. I think it's still too early to say. I mean, I was listening to Joe Biden uh, just a few days ago. It was very impressive. Yeah. Very impressive indeed. But he is 75. <laughs> and it's, uh, we have the energy at the age of 77 to conduct a, a presidential campaign. We're talking with the Clinton running. Oh, no. President, I think, yeah. I think she's had her, her chance. Um, but I, uh, just looking at the midterm candidates in the mid- midterms, there's plenty of quality candidates yeah. um, in the Democratic Party, and for that matter, the Republican Party. I mean, the, the Conservative Party is traditionally aligned with the Republican Party, and I think there's lots of sensible Republicans there which may result in trouble challenge in the primaries. Do you, do you think there's a like, well, do you think there's a possibility that it's yeah. like, I, I put it a possibility at the moment. I, yeah. I yeah. certainly wouldn't rule it out. I think mean, it's quite possible um, uh, that he'll uh, someone, but I mean, um, Mitt Romney has just been elected to the Senate. And he's the sort of guy who I think Trump wants to watch out for. Do you think Mitt Romney could cut across to the people you pointed out is that who are hurt by him? Popular, you know, who are attracted to popular. Um Yes, he could. I mean, he's, very, he's a very articulate speaker. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, again, I think he's had his chance. But then, you know, Ronald Reagan um, took two goes to, yeah. you know, uh, fought the primaries and then came in four years later and won the primaries and won the election. Um, so anything can happen. So if you were uh, American, yeah, if you're going not to answer this question, but if you were in the midterms this year, uh, and let's say you went Texas, you could vote yeah. better or more. We, we might call a centrist. Oh, I, I would have voted for the Democrats. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, without any shadow of doubt. I don't, it's not quite the same parallel. Yeah, no, of course not. You know, a, a the United States Democrat would be quite comfortable in the one nation yeah. faction. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hillary Clinton is not too far yeah, from that. Exactly. Yeah, one nation. Exactly. Group. You don't. I mean, Bernie Sanders is the sort of real, uh, the, the real yeah, yeah, yeah. Who I wouldn't vote for. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so um, uh, Britain's relationship with America, which you think it'll, it'll improve post Trump? Yes, I think actually it's capable of improving um, with Trump because I don't underestimate the ability of the Foreign Office to adapt to change circumstances. There's some very good people in the Foreign Office that have the privilege of monitoring their activities for five years, and um, I think they're quite capable of bending and accommodating. Um, uh, the whims of Trump. I mean, let's face it, it's got less than two years to go now. What was what was that like being chairman? You did, I thought you did Iraq. No, you didn't do Iraq. You did um, Libya, Syria. Syria. Yes, I mean, um, it's huge. We, I, I took over in uh, the summer of 2010. All right, and in yeah. the autumn of 2010 was the beginning of the Arab uprising. Oh my word! So, in fact, that rather dominated the following five years, and it started. Um, it started along the, Af- the African coast uh, and then with Libya, Egypt, the fall of Barak, Syria, uh, Jordan, but the, uh, the king only just hung on by the skin of his teeth. And, um, and it was all triggered, you know, simply in Tunisia by one street vendor um, burning himself to death in protest of the police wanting a backhander for his street license to trade. And that caused mass riots inside Tunisia, brought down the Tunisian yeah. government, and then the whole thing rippled through. And um, so it was its quite hard to, to look beyond that. I mean, one area we did look at was Hong Kong. And uh, 25 years on from, the, uh, from their independence. And, um, and the signing of the agreement, the Anglo, Anglo-Signing uh, Agreement, and we were, we were very concerned that the Chinese had to stuck to the terms of the deal. Indeed, when we went to, or tried to go to Hong Kong, yeah. the evidence we were banned from entering uh, Hong Kong. So it was quite, uh, it was quite confrontational stuff. But on, on the Arab Spring, what did you think we should have done at the time in Syria? I think with hindsight, I don't think we should take quite, a, quite such a hard line with, uh, with the, the king. Um, the, President. He, if we'd had a uh, revolution in, say, Birmingham, yeah, 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 yeah. we would have sent him the army. And right. if they had threatened 
or, or, or that we would have told the army to use force. I mean, whatever it takes to keep, to okay. keep control. Except we're probably better at handling a, a more escalating uh, response. Um, and so I think we should have recognised that Assad was in a difficult place. And um, actually, I think if we'd been a little bit more tolerant at the beginning, it might not have been quite so uh, confrontational. So that tolerance, what could it have led to? What, what, what could have happened? Well, um, we called straight away for Assad to escape. Yeah, okay. That was day one. Um, and I think if, if, if we had cut that out and said, Assad, you can't go around killing your, yes. killing your people in order to keep uh, order, can we come and help you? Can we give you advice? Can we uh, give you uh, aid? I mean, a very large international aid budget. You know, there were, I think there were different ways, but it's very, very easy now to sit back and say that. Uh, at the time, that wasn't obvious, and I, I, I don't criticise the Foreign Office. But do you think that once he, in 2013, the chemical attack, do you think that there was a place for us to have intervened? Oh, we, uh, we most certainly should have done, and it was only because uh, Ed Miliband was yeah. playing politics. He was, he was hoping that the government government would be defeated and it would increase its stature in the country um, and it adds derogation of duty um, and it opened the door it, 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 yeah. uh, Assad's resolve was strengthened but worst um, Putin realised the West had lost its body so he moved in yeah. Russia wasn't yeah. in so yeah, 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 exactly. point. the Iranians moved in um, uh, Islamic State uh, uh, which was an embryonic organisation at the time, um, blossomed. It was, it was disastrous. Could you, did you think these things, things, things would happen? When, yes, I mean, my speech now, I you know. Um, I said, uh, you know, we have a duty um, uh, to, you know, to prop up international order and the international institutions. Am I right in saying that Ed would have seen that intelligence that you had seen? Uh, um, yes. Wow. Wow, that's really I mean, bad. yeah. That's I, I don't really want to make. Bad. I don't want to make too big a deal of this. I mean, uh, no, no, there no, was a, there was a chemical attack, and, and uh, analysis was done, and it shown had the fingerprints of the um, So there is a place for intervention for the UK in its foreign policy. Is it a moral place? Is it moral? Is it real policy? Where do you fall on that issue? Do you think the intervention? What, on what basis should the UK to be um, military? Uh, I think very reluctantly. In truth, you should really only intervene if, if if you are threatened. But there does come a moment when you if you see someone quite prepared to massacre his own people, and you have the ability to stop it, you should. You, you should. And that was the argument over Libya. Um, Gaddafi had said he was going to kill uh, uh, the, everyone in Benghazi, and that was the trigger for us to intervene. Um, of course, we'll never know, but we probably say tens, hundreds of thousands of lives. Well, uh, do, you, do you appraise Libya as a, a positive case? Yes, I mean, a lot of people says that, well, we didn't plan for the aftermath. Well, don't forget that Libya, in the aftermath, had elections, voted in a parliament, voted in a president, mm. And it was stable. It, it, it only fell apart after that. Hmm. Is that yeah, okay? Okay. Um, and sort of to, to finish up, I'm going to ask you some quick fire tabloid style questions. Who should be the next leader of the Third Party? The rest of the Oh come on! I, I mean, it's too early to say. I mean, personally, I think Theresa May may well go on for many years, and someone, someone who we did, we haven't really thought about May's service is that David Cameron was the better man in sport. Why did you not go with Ken Clark? <laughs> um, I had backed Ken Clark twice before, <laughs> and uh, and I could see that he was it was never going to cut. Through. He personally was never going to cut through, and so we I wanted a liberal leader which the right wing of the Tory party could accept, and that was David Cameron. Do you think there is a place for a Euro pro-European leader of the Conservative Party? Not at the moment, no. I, I, um, at the time, I mean, David Cameron was actually fairly ambiguous about where he stood over yeah. Europe. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, I think he was very pragmatic, and he came out as a Remainer at the end. And I think he believed it, but it wasn't obvious all the way through. Okay. Um, who should be, in your opinion, uh, the leader of the Labour Party? 
that's easy to answer. I think uh, Keir Starmer has been very impressive. Mm-hmm. And uh, they've got a sense they're making their name. Diane Abbott, not too fancy. Actually, <laughs> Diane, Diane, actually, I do know Diane personally. She's a very engaging person. I would no more want her leading the country or, or leading a political party than I would fly down the road. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is your biggest regret in politics ever? Um... I don't even notice that. I think there are times I wish I'd dug my heels in a bit harder than I, than I may have done. On issues that you believe in? Yeah. Is there one Europe or it was social issues? Or? Yeah, um, not particularly. Funny enough, it, um, uh, uh, assisted dying has been a, a, a great a cause I've always championed. And I wish I'd actually uh, raised the game, raised the bar higher. There and I believe reform will come actually in, in, in the next few years. But and I'm campaigning outside of Parliament for that change. But on some of some of the bigger issues, um, actually, actually very few regrets because I thought David, David the opposition years, your opportunities. Then David Cameron took over. And frankly, I he and George Osborne, I pretty much agree with everything they were doing. Really? Yeah. Do you think George Osborne could be the leader of the party, barring Brexit? I think. Um, if he'd stayed, he would have been in the mix, whether exactly how it could Okay. Yeah. But you don't, don't assume it would have been a coronation. No. 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 Okay. Okay. Do you think Boris Johnson will ever be leader? I'm pretty sure he won't be. <laughs> <laughs> um, Boris, Boris gave a very engaging guy. I just think most people realise that um, uh, there isn't leadership quality there. Do you think we could have a Miliband style leadership contest with David, David versus Ed, Boris versus Joe? Um, oh, I'd go for Joe. <laughs> Actually, I wouldn't rule out Joe later on in life being yeah, coming back into the cabinet into quite a senior position. Okay, who is the one person that isn't in cabinet that should be, in your opinion? I've, I've always been. I've, I've always been rather impressed by Tom Toon, who is yeah, yeah, the yeah, chairman yeah, of the yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, who is the one person in cabinet that shouldn't be there? Uh, and, uh, they're all wonderful guys. <laughs> They're not all men. <laughs> and girls. <laughs> okay, um, and what is the thing you are most proud of in politics? Um, surviving, I think, really. <laughs> I mean, because um, I actually did win a hopeless seat mm-hmm. uh, yeah, in 1983. Yeah, yeah. I won the Not- Nottingham North. In fact, in hindsight, perhaps that's what I ought to be proudest of. Um, what was the swing? Um, uh, 10.5%. Bloody hell. Largest swing in the country. Did you see it coming? Um, Funny enough, yes, it's one of my campaign workers who said every tenth person we're talking to says that they voted Labour last time, but they're going to vote for you this time. It's 10%, yeah. yeah. Not bad. No. No. What is the secret to success? Plug away. Plug away. Don't, you know, don't, don't overreach yourself. Don't, get, don't go beyond your abilities in a way, actually. And, uh, I mean, I, I recognised right from the beginning I was never going to be leader of the Conservative Party. Why? Um, oh, as well, because I could see that there were, there were people more suitable than, than myself. Wow. But I thought I could play a, make a big contribution as a good, solid party, uh, party member of Parliament who could be relied on most of the time, but whose opinions were sought um, on, on the key issues. And I thoroughly enjoyed the contribution I made. Uh, but I that very satisfying. Is there a cabin role you wish you would have done? Actually, I would love to be the International Development Secretary. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, one, one of the great jobs. I agree. Okay, so for young, Conservative Society in Kings is full of people who want to be the next Prime Minister, right? And we've got a first year representative election going on right now. Careerism is at all time. What tips do you have for our budding Borisites, our Joeites, Cameronites, and Osmanites? Get a life. <laughs> Get a life before you go to Parliament. It, 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 is, it is so rewarding being in Parliament, but don't think of it until you're 40 years old. Uh, get out of university or college or training, whatever yeah, vocational yeah, yeah. stuff you're doing. Um, Get some experience of the world. Perhaps if you want to start a family, start a family. If you want to buy a house, buy a house. Then, um, round about the age of forty, then uh, and then, then get stuck in it. You could you could be involved in the Tory party, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, or, or the Labour party, or the Liberals, or whatever, yeah. any party you like. Um, but don't don't make it the be all and end all in your youth. Okay, why should people go into politics? 
because democracy is the way we run our country, and unless good men come forward and women come forward and, and show willingness to contribute to the system under which we run, and frankly, a fairly civilized and successful society, um, then that society will fail. So, in a way, people who've got the interest and ability, everyone's got a duty to do. Yes. Thomas Jefferson quoted, Dem- democracy needs to be renewed by blood, something or something, not necessarily blood, but being green, yeah, you need to be renewed. Right. So, what is the funniest story you have from Parliament? You don't have to say names, you say an MP. <laughs> there are many, many funny stories of Parliament, none of which I can say on screen. Oh, <laughs> okay. And what is the, this is a sort of less sad, uh, bad agenda, what was the saddest story for you? What was the most sad you ever felt in politics? I, I was pretty gutted when the party lost in 97, but John Major didn't, didn't deserve to lose. Uh, yeah. I had a complete landslide that he did. It, 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 this was a good man doing, yeah. doing his best to hold it together. So I think from a political point of view, it was, it, it was uh, it, that, that was ghastly, uh, in all honesty. I actually thought the expenses saga in 2009 oh, really? was a really regrettable episode, which could have been handled in a much better way if we thought it could be seen in Hamlet. So you should have been more public? I think somehow Parliament should have actually put, put forward a spokesman who actually explained uh, the yeah. system of this basis and how the system worked. Okay, sorry, I said the last one, I would have to ask two more. Who's your favourite leader that's never been and who's your favourite leader that has been? Um, the favourite leader we should have had, no idea, it was Mike Mouse. Absolutely, but, absolutely um, right. <laughs> uh, because he, he, he straddled the divide. Yeah. He was quite capable of speaking to the right and to the left born out of the left of the Tory party, centre-right, uh, but was quite capable of, of going. He was the man who wanted to privatise the post office and was stopped by the right wing. <laughs> um, I think, I, uh, I have to say, I'm a huge admirer of David Cameron. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Richard Osborne. My pleasure.